Hi, hello, and other such phrases. I'm the Defective Brain, and I'm here to break down a scientific paper for you. Today we're going to examine evidence that shows that your unfinished antibiotic course will kill us all. The paper we're looking at is titled Clonal Expansion During Staphylococcus Aureus Infection Dynamics Reveals the Effect of Antibiotic Intervention. So let's get into it. What is this paper about? This paper is about how a population of bacteria with all sorts of different genotypes can change and adapt in response to the immune system and to the application of antibiotics. The first thing that we really need to understand before we really start digging into this paper is the concept of population bottlenecks and what that can do to the genetic diversity within a population. So let's go straight to a hypothetical example. Let's imagine you start off with a population of bacteria. They are all the same species, they can get along fine with each other and are pretty chilled out. But within this population, there are only two genotypes, either red or blue. And let's say there are equal numbers of these red and blue bacteria. And if we just leave this population alone to grow and multiply, there will continue to be an equal numbers of red and blue bacteria. Neither genotype has any advantage over the other. But now, what will happen if we squeeze this population through what is called a bottleneck? That is, the population is going to get reduced down drastically. Most of these guys you see up on the screen, they're going to die. They're going to get killed off by, let's say, Mr. Macrophage, who comes along and gets really angry at them and decides to just kill off half of them at random. Doesn't care which one, whether it's red or blue, just starts killing. The proportions of red or blue bacteria will no longer be exactly equal. And any population that grows from these bacteria, in general, will no longer be equally red or blue. But here is where things get bizarre. The smaller the numbers of bacteria that left after this bottleneck, the less likely it is that the proportions of each genotype will be completely equal. In fact, there is a greater chance that they'll diverge radically. Think about it like this. Let's look at a population of bacteria that are almost equal, but differ just by one bacterium. So we have a population of 100 bacteria with 49 blue bacteria and 51 red. Percentage-wise, that is a fairly small difference between the populations, and we can generalize them to being equal, usually. But let's say if we halve that population to 24 blue and 26 red instead. Even though the real term difference is still just one bacterium, the actual percentage difference is double that of the previous example. I mean, it gets even more extreme if we go down to, say, five total bacteria, it gets to 20%. At three, one bacterium will out the number the other two to one. And if it, the entire population is reduced just to one bacterium, only that genotype will survive. So let's say if you know that an infection starts off with a 50-50 ratio of genotypes, and then measure how those genotype ratios change during the course of infection, with some clever mathematical modelling, you can calculate the size of the population bottleneck. And using this kind of modelling technique, you can tell whether a gene is beneficial to the bacterium as it causes an infection by forcing it to compete with another bacterium that doesn't have that gene. You can use this model to predict how that will change its competitive ability. So the focus of this study was on a bacterium called Staphylococcus aureus. You may know this bacterium from such diseases as impetigo, sepsis, and multi-drug resistant infections. And this last one is a real concern. Our main treatment against bacterial infections are antibiotics, and so the evolution and the spread of antibiotic-resistant bacteria is a growing problem. Soon we're going to have infections that we just cannot treat. One of the things that is supposedly fueling this boom in antibiotic-resistant bacteria is the leakage of antibiotics into the environment. There is an argument to say that perhaps they don't have an effect, because if they're not killing off the bacteria, then antibiotic-resistant bacteria have no selective advantage over normal bacteria, because neither of them are getting a lethal dose of antibiotics. But how do we know this? How can we show this? Well, we can do this by using mixed populations of antibiotic-resistant and antibiotic-sensitive bacteria, and then infecting them in the host, and see which genotype dominates the infection. So first, they need to understand how a population works during an infection. So they'll need to have a set of genotypes that have no effect on the actual bacteria's survival that can allow them to be told apart. So if you remember my example, I used blue and red. But in reality, the, one of the most reliable ways of doing that is using different antibiotic resistant genes instead of putting them in different colours. So these can be used as genetic markers that are very easy to screen because all you have to do is put your bacteria onto your antibiotic and you tell what genotype is based on whether it survives the antibiotic or whether it just gets killed off. Very simple. So they took a strain of Staphylococcus aureus and they derived three genotypes from it, which were either resistant to canamycin, erythromycin, or tetracycline. Essentially, all these antibiotics work to slow down the bacteria's protein-making apparatus, making them slower and less able to fight off the immune system, and in the best case scenario, it just shuts them down completely and causes them to die off. The important thing to remember is these antibiotic resistance genes are still working even when there aren't any antibiotics around. So we have to make sure that they don't have an effect on the normal growth of a bacteria. The researchers put each bacterial strain into a nutrient broth. When they enter the broth, they grow and grow and grow. As they grow, the broth becomes more cloudy and light just gets absorbed by it. The less light that gets through the broth, the more bacteria are in there. So you can use this to measure how the bacterial population grows. So that is what the first graph shows us. 
it measures the growth of all three of these derived strains of antibiotic resistant bacteria up against the original strain from which they're derived. So, and from this we can see that they have the same growth. All three lines pretty much sit on top of each other. Okay, that's great. But we have to make sure that there is no difference between these bacteria in a real infection. So the researchers then tested them out in zebrafish embryos. Zebrafish only have the innate immune system, which consists mainly of phagocytes that just chomp the bacteria. No T cells, no B cells. They're very simple to work with, and that's why they're used here. Anyway, they injected these bacteria into different zebrafish embryos and measured the time it took for these bacterial infections to kill the zebrafish. What you're looking at here is a survival graph, and every time one or more zebrafish dies, the line dips. And as you can probably see, the patterns on these lines are pretty much the same. The take-home message, in normal circumstances, the expression of these genes have no effect on the ability of these bacteria to grow and cause an infection. Which brings us to the important bit. We need to know how well each of these strains compete against each other in a normal infection. Well, we've seen that they aren't any more virulent, and they don't seem to grow any better in an ideal situation. But we really want to see that neither strain has any advantage competing with the other one. So the researchers infected a three-way mixture of each of these different antibiotic resistance strains into the zebrafish embryos. They then left the zebrafish for about four days before extracting the bacteria from them and counting them. They could then test these bacteria on different antibiotics to tell which one is which, and from that they can get an idea of the proportion of each genotype at the end of infection. So that's what makes up this figure. Each pie chart represents just one zebrafish embryo and the proportions of the different antibiotic resistant strains within it. Quite a lot of them actually seem to have just one strain left. They repeated this experiment using a different, more virulent strain just to double check. They found pretty much the same thing. Now the researchers say that they tested this against their model, which could show the basic distribution of these strains and assess whether one strain is being favoured or the others. It looks like the erythromycin resistant strains are handicapped, but that's just me seeing a pattern. That's what humans do. What statistical models allow us to do is to take that out of the equation and actually test that mathematically. And they say that based on the statistical model, the probability of either, either one of these strains dominating doesn't actually change, and that this distribution is what you'd expect if neither strain actually had a competitive advantage. But here I come to my first gripe. Where is this model that they test this data against? Where is it? It's none of the methods. So the p-number that they show really doesn't mean anything. If we can't see how they calculated it, you don't even have to give the full equation. You can just give us a reference to the paper where that equation is. Put in the methods section to make it absolutely clear that that is the method you've been replicating for this study. Anyway, the researchers next attempted to test these dynamics in mice. So they injected the three-way cocktail of those strains, but this time into the bloodstreams of mice. They then assessed the average numbers of bacteria within the kidneys, liver, spleen, heart, and lung. And it starts off doing very well in the liver and the spleen, and but it tends to go down towards the end of the infection. But look at what they're doing in the kidneys. They're growing like nobody's business up in there. But that's not what we're focusing on. The main important part is, is the proportions of each genotype and how well they compete against each other, even when there is no antibiotic there. Let's look at what they do in each organs, and here is the raw data for each organ on each day. Luckily, the authors were kind enough to simplify the data for us, but let's explain how they simplified it. They recognise that there are four basic population patterns. The first pattern is you can have all the strains present in more or less equal numbers, and that they show up in yellow. Another pattern is where you can have one strain completely dominating the infection and outnumbering the other two a hundred times over, and this one they show up in blue. The third pattern you can have are two strains which share the dominance, but the, they both outnumber the third strain by over a hundred times, so two of those strains are just sharing dominance. And then sometimes, on rare occasions, you may have a situation where the most dominant strain outnumbers the least dominant strain by a hundred times, but that remaining one sits in the middle of that, the two. That is what is called spread dominance. This last one is shown up in green. So when we start off, there are no dominant strains, it's all yellow. But as the infection goes on, dominant strains tend to emerge until the very last day where the majority of all infections, they've all become just one genotype. So those population bottlenecks happen in both in mice, which have a full, fully active uh, immune system, and in zebrafish, which only have that small innate immune system component. So now we have a little bit of insight into how bacterial populations vary during an infection. Now we can see what happens when we introduce a little bit of antibiotic. We're focusing in on low doses because we want to pull apart the really subtle effects of what happens when you have a bacterial population exposed to doses that are solo, they don't even kill the bacteria. And whether in that situation you can get antibiotic resistant bacteria having some sort of advantage over non-resistant bacteria. But what exactly is that magic low dose? So here we have another survival experiment with infected zebrafish embryos given antibiotics via their fish tank water and given in different concentrations versus a completely untreated control. Remember, we want to select the dose that has no difference on the outcome of infection. They found that that dosage was 5 micrograms per mil. They then halved that dose and performed all further experiments with 2.5 micrograms per mil. 
and they found that there was pretty much no difference between the untreated versus antibiotic treated zebrafish. And then when the researchers actually counted the numbers of bacteria within the zebrafish in each group, they found again that actually there's no difference. So now they know the dose, they can actually test what effect it'll have on a bacterial population. So they mixed up a resistant bacterium with a non-resistant strain of that same bacterium. They went back to the Staphylococcosaurus strains that they created and they chose to test the erythromycin resistant staph against the tetracycline resistant staph. So they mixed up equal proportions of both strains and infected them into zebrafish embryos. They then added their low dose of antibiotic and after what I presume was five days because the authors aren't exactly clear about it, they assess the proportions of each strain. What we see on this graph are the ratios of sensitive bacteria to resistant bacteria. High values show when the sensitive bacteria are winning out in the infection, and the lower values show when the resistant bacterium is winning out. At dead center, where the ratio is equal to one, that is when both strains are carried equally within the same fish. Now, you remember all the those previous population graphs, where one strain tends to end up predominating in a single animal, but if there is no selective pressure, then that strain has an equal probability of being antibiotic resistant, what do you think that will do to the data? It will cause it to be spread out, and the actual data will tend towards creating two peaks. One where the antibiotic resistant bacteria are winning, and one where the antibiotic sensitive bacteria are winning out. If there is no selection pressure, then you'll expect these peaks to both be equal. But if there is a slight selection pressure, one of the peaks will be smaller, and the average will move downwards. And so that is what you'd expect to see if there is a bottleneck event. And to be fair, that is sort of similar to what they see. They see very spread data, and when they have a very tiny dose of antibiotic, they find that the data skews in favour of the antibiotic resistant bacteria. Remember, this dose doesn't kill them. All it does is give them that one little push that makes them more able to cope than the sensitive bacteria. And part of that could be because they're using tetracycline, which is at low doses a bacteriostatic drug. That is, it slows down the bacteria, so it is possible for it to affect a bacterium without actually killing it. But it turns out this, this actually has a narrow window in which it gives the antibiotic resistant bacteria an advantage because when the researcher decided to lower that dose even more to one microgram per mil, that advantage disappeared. The great thing about zebrafish embryos is that you can pull apart the individual components of the immune response. Because remember, the big part of that population bottleneck is the immune system wiping out a whole bunch of bacteria at random. So the researchers asked, what happens if we take the immune system out of the equation? What happens if that bottleneck never happened? The researchers have a drug that could knock out phagocytes called amorphalino, which actually targets the genes that cause these phagocytes to be produced, and it shuts them down. So now we have zebrafish embryos with no immune system. What will happen if we redo the last experiment with them? The graphs show that nearly across the board, even when low doses of antibiotics are given, the populations are dead even. I don't know why this happens, but I'm going to put on my speculation hat, I'm going to tell you what I think. Imagine you're in a cinema, and you want to go see the movie, you're waiting in line, but you know that a large number of loud, smelly, and obnoxious people are on the way, and you don't want them to come into the theatre with you, because you know you won't enjoy the movie if they're there. Now, you know a ton of people who would want to see that movie, and you know that if you can call the, all of them up and get them to the theatre before those loud, obnoxious people, you can fill up the cinema with all your friends. If you put a bum on every seat, those obnoxious bores will have no way to get in the cinema, because all the seats are taken up. A similar thing can happen with bacterial niches. If you fill up a niche with, say, probiotic bacteria, then it makes it more difficult for an infectious bacteria to enter that niche. This is what I call the bums on seats hypothesis, because if you get a bum on every seat in that cinema, nasties can't get in. It's one of the purported reasons as to why probiotic cocktails work, but I think something similar might be happening here, because we have two types of bacteria that are competing for niche space within an infected host. During the early stages of infection, all the niches that are open for Staphylococcus aureus are taken up quickly, and if nothing else happens, they stay occupied. It's only when the immune system comes along and clears out some, some of those bacteria that new niches open up, and that is when the competition really happens. If the antibiotic is present during that competition, then the antibiotic resistant bacteria will have an advantage. And that's my crackpot theory. Take it or leave it. But anyway, let's go back to the paper. The next figure, they did the exact same thing, but with the more virulent Staphylococcus aureus strain, and they pretty much found the same effects. Next, they moved on to an MRSA, that is, a methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. They knocked out the methicillin resistance and replaced it with tetracycline resistance. And then they looked at what happens when you try out these experiments, but instead using a completely different type of antibiotic, that is, a methicillin-type antibiotic. So again, new antibiotic, new dosage. They had to find a new low dose to try out on this infection. And I'll be honest, they didn't entirely succeed. Whilst that dosage doesn't have an effect on the survival of zebrafish, when they looked at the actual bacterial numbers, the dose was still high enough to cause bacteria to die off during infection, which kind of kneecaps the rest of their results for this particular strain. 
because now when we see that the population ratios have shifted, we know that that's based on the bacterial counts, which we also know are caused by the direct killing of the bacteria by the antibiotic. That's probably why that effect persists, even when they get rid of the phagocytes. And when they did try to find a dose that was lower, there was no difference between the two populations. There was no population shifting or anything like that. What was happening? This could be down to the fact that they were using a different antibiotic. That is oxacillin, which is uh, very similar to methicillin. The thing is, this antibiotic may not even have a subcurative dose. As I explained before, tetracycline just slows down the growth of the bacteria. Whereas these methicillin type antibiotics mess around with the cell wall of the bacteria and directly kill them off. So it could be that methicillin either has two effects. It could either kill off the bacterium or be at too low a dose to do anything. In the next experiment, the researchers tried to work out whether this effect could happen in a different species of bacteria. They looked at Pseudomonas aeruginosa. After Staphylococcus aureus, this is one of the biggest causes of hospital-acquired infections, so we'd naturally want to explore the spread of antibiotic resistance within this species. The thing about Pseudomonas is it is just naturally less susceptible to tetracycline. It has an intrinsic resistance to this antibiotic, which means you have to give it really super high amounts in order for it to have any effect. So the smallest dose that was found to be around 50 micrograms per mil, and when you actually counter the bacteria, they could find no significant difference. But these counts do look different from the Staphylococcus aureus counts we saw earlier. When they tried this out in Staphylococcus aureus, what do you notice about the distribution of those data points? They're pretty tight, but when you do this experiment using Pseudomonas aeruginosa, look how spread out those points are. So again, they tried out the 50-50 mix experiment where they competed the resistant bacterium to non-resistant bacteria, and they found that the resistant bacteria did better when there was antibiotic present. So this same effect happens irrespective of what species of a bacteria you're looking at. But there is another wrinkle here, because this time when they got rid of the zebrafish embryo immune system, that advantage remained. So the question is, what is so different about Pseudomonas? I am going to don my speculator spectacles and tell you my theory. Remember those bacterial counts? I think the main reason that they are so spread out is because that Pseudomonas doesn't saturate its niche as quickly as Staphylococcus aureus does. To go back to the metaphor, this time the cinema isn't full up yet, and people can still compete for those last seats. That's why even when the phagocytes are gone, there is still empty niche spaces, but that's just my interpretation of the raw data. I'm not going to talk much about the next experiment because it basically found the same as all the other experiments, except they went back to the original uh, strain of Staphylococcus aureus, and they treated with erythromycin instead of tetracycline just to show that it, this effect was the same for erythromycin, which we'd sort of expect because erythromycin, like tetracycline, targets the RNA complex, and so would cause a slowdown in growth, and so there would be this kind of window there as well. They also messed around with some strains that had the ability to produce reactive oxygen species because of some convoluted theory in that antibiotics causing bacteria to get stressed out and produce more uh, reactive oxygen species, and that's what kills them off. But what they found was that having reactive oxygen species there or not doesn't seem to have an effect on the outcome of infection. So uh, I don't really see the need to delve in too much deeper into that. So they did all this great work in the zebrafish, but as we know, the zebrafish only have macrophages and phagocytes and innate immune cell type things. So the next step would be to demonstrate that this kind of population shift occurs with a fully operational immune system, a mammalian immune system, such as what you'd find in a mouse. They infected the mice and counted the numbers of bacteria in the liver, the spleen, and the kidneys, and they added them all up and they compared how much these levels were in mice that were completely untreated, or what mice were treated with 0.1 milligrams per mil of tetracycline, or 0.2 milligrams per mil of tetracycline, and they found no significant difference. Because of that, both of these were used as sub-curative doses for their later experiments. I could go into why finding no significant difference isn't the same as finding a significant similarity, and why proving the null hypothesis is pretty shady, but I don't have time for that right now. So they infected their mix of sensitive and resistant bacteria into mice, and counted them in the kidneys, liver, and the spleen. At 0.2 milligrams per mil, they found that the antibiotic resistant bacteria had an advantage, and most of this could be explained not just by the bacteria in the liver or the spleen, but the primary point where all the competition appears to be happening is in the kidneys. Which, if we revisit my crackpot theory, that bacterial infection is kind of like a crowded cinema, then it would make sense that kidneys would be the place where everything's happened, because if we go back all the way to one of the first experiments, the only organ in which the bacterial populations were increasing throughout the experiment were found to be the kidney. Those ever-expanding graph, they could indicate open the opening up of new niche spaces as the infection progresses. But, you see, that's just my interpretation of the results. I mean, it could be something completely different. You should believe the data. I mean, any interpretation that comes from me, or anywhere else, is just set dressing for the data. It's something to help you contextualize the data, but it's not pure fact. In this last figure of the paper, they do something quite funny with the statistics that I think you'd like to hear. Throughout this paper, they've been analysing the resistant slash non-resistant ratio using the Mann-Whitney U-test. Now, this is a kind of analysis used when data doesn't uh, 
a line along a normal bell curve. And fair enough. As I've explained before, this data doesn't follow a bell curve. The pattern you'd expect be akin to twin peaks rather than a single bell curve, which is, it's definitely not the best way of doing things, but it'll do the job. I mean, the best way to do it would be to dig out some equations that you can use to transform the, this two peak distribution into something more similar to a bell curve. And then you can use all those analytical tools developed for analyzing the bell curve, such as t-tests and what have you. And you can use those to analyze your data. But the researchers only seem to figure that out at the last figure. So the big question I have is, if they figure this out, why didn't they use it before? On all these zebrafish experiments, there is no real reason why they should change the way they analyze their data just for mice, and not even in all the mice experiments, just for this particular mouse experiment. It looks like they changed their method at the last minute just specifically for that last data because they couldn't find any significance using the Mann-Whitney test that they've been using throughout the entire paper beforehand. If you don't know why this is shady, then I recommend that you look up something called Researcher Degrees of Freedom. But, you know what? That isn't even the most funny part of this. No. It's what they did to their data that, that cracks me up. They decided that the best way to treat this data was to transform it as a binomial distribution. For those of you who aren't familiar with the binomial distribution, let me explain to you what it is. It is basically a normal distribution. The only difference is the type of data you get. The binomial distribution applies to non-continuous data. Say, if you wanted to measure the numbers of people in a room, because you can't have half a person, half a person is a corpse. So in that case, you can only use whole numbers. But here's the thing, the binomial distribution has a counterpart that is almost identical to it, but it deals with continuous data. Would you like to know what that counterpart is? It's the normal distribution, the bell curve. So their main assumption in trying to get their data be to be transformed into a normal distribution is that the data is already normally distributed. It in no way reflects the actual distribution, which we'd expect to be something called, uh, let me look this up. It's called a bimodal distribution. Hmm. One of the researchers must have said, Could you look up this statistical transformation for me? It begins with a B. Slap anything up there, no one will care. I get that these two distributions have similar names, but that, that is no excuse. Especially when we're dealing with specific scientific terminology. This is not some innocent spelling error. This stuff matters. But there is such a cavalier, carefree attitude when it comes to presenting their statistics and their data in this paper. The worst thing is that there is the shadow there that indicates that they know the right way to present their data. They're just not doing it. It's laziness. All research stands on the data, and statistics provide us with the best tool for understanding and contextualizing that data. It does us all a disservice when it is mishandled. But every paper has its flaws, and a lot of the time they can be found in the stats section. I've seen far more egregious statistical sinning in scientific papers, and these flubs are comparatively minor. The tools they use are fascinating, and actually if we find all the stats problems with this paper, they present a really interesting story. The biggest take home from here is that it is entirely possible for antibiotic resistant bacteria to dominate a bacterial population even when there are no antibiotics present, and that even the smallest amounts can drastically improve their chances of dominating an infection. This is why getting rid of antibiotic resistant bacteria is going to be so difficult. They've already become so prevalent, and now it's going to be a really hard battle trying to get them out of circulation. And the second thing which you can take from this paper is that it's really, really important for you to finish your course of antibiotics, because even low doses of antibiotics can give bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics an edge of a bacteria that would ordinarily be treatable. If there is one very important lesson you should take from this is that we have a difficult war to fight against antibiotic resistant bacteria and we need to be careful how we deploy antibiotics because every wasted treatment is another opportunity for bacteria to adapt. We need to stop them.